This is the Transmilenio, a 114km bus rapid transit system in Colombia's capital city. And it's one of the most successful of its kind in the world. It's a series of segregated express lanes in which articulated buses ferry people around the city, a bit like a railway on pneumatic wheels. It's a cheap and effective solution that helps about a quarter of Bogota's 8 million residents get around every day. In fact, Colombia has long been a pioneer in innovative public transport systems and its ideas have spread across the world. But as ingenious as the Transmillennio is, it's actually just a band-aid for a problem that's rumbled on for more than 80 years. Bogota literally has the worst traffic in the world. Last year, the average Bogotano lost over 10 days of their life sitting in traffic. That's two more days than just five years ago. But change is coming down the track. This is the Bogota Metro, a 24km line that'll take over a million people per day out of their cars and put them into fully automated driverless trains high above the city. But getting to this point hasn't been easy or quick. It's taken over 80 years to get here. So the real question is, why has it taken so long? And could a spat between Colombia's two most powerful people threaten to derail this project yet again? Close your eyes and think of Colombia. What comes to mind? You're probably thinking about the birthplace of magical realism and its Nobel Prize winning literature, or as the home of the legendary El Dorado or its incredible biodiversity boasting the biggest variety of birds in the world. What you might not realize is that for decades, it's been a global pioneer in using transport to solve some of its most intractable social issues. This is Medellin, Colombia's second biggest city. In the 2000s, it began a series of ambitious civic works to transform itself from a place nearly destroyed by Colombia's other famous export into a modern, inclusive metropolis. That included expanding the city's metro system and building cable cars and escalators in steep, low-income neighbourhoods. Now, those last two were critical. They were innovative uses of cheap, existing technology which helped open the city up to residents living in slums on the steep mountains around the outskirts of the city. These simple interventions radically transformed access across Medellin and changed the lives of the city's poorest residents. Medellin still has lots of poverty, but once no-go areas are now thriving. The idea of using ski lifts and escalators to improve mobility in cities has since been adopted all over the place. It's also earned Colombia a reputation for pioneering urban planning. But that reputation doesn't quite extend to the capital. Imagine you're traveling through London, which has about the same population as Bogota. You can keep the buses, but take away the tube, the trains, the trams, light rail, and finally, even the boats. Now, squeeze everything into about a third of the space, and that's how you end up with the worst congestion in the world. Now, it's been obvious for a long time that Bogota needs a metro system, but if you're starting from scratch, how do you decide what to build? Well, why not join us on our very own game show, The Wheel of Transport. Building at ground level or at grade is one solution. In fact, Bogota did indeed once have a tram network and a mainline railway. But like so many other cities from LA to Auckland, these gave way to the car in the 1950s and the rest is history. From an engineer's point of view, it's by far the easiest railway to build. Although, if you're planning one in an existing, densely built-up city, then there's a slight problem. You're going to have to bulldoze your way through anything that stands in its path. So, if that's not an option, you might want to consider going underground. But before we look at the second option, we have to acknowledge that whichever way Bogota chooses to go, the engineers working on this project are going to have some pretty elaborate calculations to figure out. If you want to brush up on your geometry skills but aren't quite ready to take on a PhD in advanced mathematics, then today's video sponsor Brilliant has got you covered. The team at Brilliant know that we learn best through doing, not reading through dense textbooks. That's why they provide thousands of interactive lessons with topics covering mathematics, data analysis, programming, and even AI. Instead of being stuck in a classroom, Brilliant is available on the go, which means that if you're one of the people lucky enough to live somewhere that already has great public transport, or we're looking at you, Hong Kong or Berlin, then you can wrap your head around spatial problem solving from the comfort of the MTR. 
To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash the B1M, scan the QR code on screen, or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Now, let's get on to option two. This method does pretty much what it says in the tin. Dig a big trench, stick your railway in, and then cover it back up. The cut and cover method was used to build the first ever underground railway in London in 1863, and has since been used to build subways everywhere from New York to Tokyo. The benefit is it leaves no long-term presence above ground, aside from the station entrances, and it's much less technically challenging than deeper tunnels. The downside is the chaos it causes during construction. Just ask anybody in Vancouver who remembers the Canada Line being constructed. Promises of three months of disruption became 18 months. Every single business was hurt during that time period. Now, given that Bogota is trying to build a metro to decrease congestion, this probably isn't the best option, but there is an alternative. The tunnel boring machine, the gold standard of tunnel construction. TBMs are great because they don't interfere with the surface, more than a hole to drop them into and a hole to pick them back out of. But they're not suitable for all ground types. Too hard and you're better off blasting your way through with explosives. Too soft and the TBM can cause the earth around it to collapse in a process called settlement. Now, the top strata of Bogota's soil is made up of fluvio leucostrine quaternary deposits. That's layers of sediment left over from rivers and lakes over the last couple of million years. That's exactly the type of soil that could be disturbed by a TBM, and in 2013, work began on studying the soil conditions and trying to work out how it might react. Researchers found that although the earth was soft, it was similar to that found in London, Madrid and Shanghai, all cities with extensive underground metro systems. Analysis of TBMs working at 16 meters and 13 meters showed the maximum expected settlement to be below an acceptable limit of 10 millimeters meaning the ground could withstand a tunnel being dug without collapsing. But there's one major problem with any TBM projects, and that is the sheer cost. Out of all the options looked at, this was by far the most expensive, which left Bogota with only one option. If you can't go through it, and you can't go under it, then you've got to go over it. And so, in 2016, Line 1 of the Bogota Metro was unveiled a 23.96km viaduct with 16 stations running across the city. But how do you build a bridge that long? Well, you need a giant piece of machinery. This is a beam launcher, an automated system which transforms individual concrete segments into bridges. Here's how it works. A 220-ton crane is used to assemble the beam launcher onto precast bridge piers. Once in place, the launcher is fed concrete units known as U-beams. Now, each U-beam is about 10 meters wide, 3 meters long, and weighs about 64 tons. At the base are a series of holes which allow tethering cables to be fed through. The U-beams can be hoisted from a ground-level truck or delivered on pre-existing stretches of the line. They're lowered at staggered heights to allow room for them to turn into place before the whole top row is lowered, after which workers seal the joints with glue. When each section is complete, the whole crane is rolled forward onto the next section to continue the production line. 631 of these prefabricated stretches are being constructed using over 7,000 U-beam segments. Like the best of Colombia's transport solutions, constructing a viaduct around a city is a relatively cheap solution to a big problem. So why oh why has it taken so long? Well, it's all down to a mix of resources and a healthy dose of political rivalry. The idea of a metro was first suggested way back in 1942, but political instability and financial pressures meant it took another 40 years for the first serious studies to be undertaken. By the 1980s, a consensus was finally reached to build a metro. Then arguments about how it would be financed rolled on for years. But what really sank the Bogota metro back then was another project over 200 kilometers away. Work on the Medellin metro began in 1984, but costs quickly spiralled. It was abandoned for four years, and eventually cost four times more than originally planned. In 1997, when Colombia entered a recession, the mayor of Bogotá, Enrique Peñalosa, declared that plans to build a tunnel were too expensive, and used the funds to build the Transmilenio instead. 
The project didn't see any major progress until 2013, when the new mayor, Gustavo Petro, promised a final agreement for the metro, which featured a 32km board tunnel with 27 stations. The studies and design were completed in 2014, but crucially, before work began, Petro left office and was succeeded by his rival and former mayor, Enrique Peñalosa. True to form, in 2016, citing rising costs, Peñalosa again scrapped the underground metro and instead proposed a viaduct as a more cost-effective solution. Starting from scratch, it took another five years for construction to begin. But it doesn't stop there. Petro never abandoned his dreams of an underground metro, and his voice became even louder when in 2022 he was elected President of Colombia. Despite construction work being underway since 2021, Petro has continued to argue for his original plan and even called for parts of the line to be redirected underground. However, with work well underway and on track to complete by 2028, it's extremely unlikely that any changes are going to be made now. What it does show is the huge challenge of building something like a metro from scratch and the legacies that can be created for those involved. For decades, Colombia's shown the world how to build against the odds, and now its most difficult projects may soon join its long list of accomplishments. Until then, there's always the Transmillenio. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. You can learn more about that at the link below. Don't forget that we're raising awareness of construction's mental health crisis and supporting charities in this space through our Get Construction Talking initiative. There's a video series on our channel and you can find support or donate over at getconstructiontalking.org. And as always guys, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you're subscribed to the B1M.